Good evening to everybody and also from my side a very warm welcome to beautiful Sintra. It's of course an extraordinary pleasure to be here and see you all in person. This is just uh, fantastic. I hope you all enjoyed the first course of the dinner and are now looking forward to our dinner conversation. As the president already said, this year we are not going to have a conventional dinner speech, but we are going to have a hopefully lively discussion with our dear guests, Elaine Ray and Richard Portis, on the topic threats to financial stability. The topic clearly has regained relevance. The war has pushed inflation further up and has lowered growth expectations. Sovereign and private debt are high, also as a result of the pandemic. And some asset prices are difficult to reconcile with fundamentals. When interest rates rise sharply, fragilities may appear with different types of assets, regions, financial intermediaries being exposed in different ways and to different degrees. So what better time could there be to discuss these issues with two of the best experts in the field? And there is, of course, no need for an introduction, but I will have a short introduction anyway. Both Elaine and Richard are professors of economics at the London Business School and have made numerous groundbreaking contributions in their respective fields. Let me mention Elaine's work on the global financial cycle, which turned the classical trilemma of international macroeconomics into a dilemma, and it remains an important concept today. Jointly, Elaine and Richard wrote a highly influential paper on the determinants of equity market integration, pointing to the geography of information as the main determinant of cross-border equity flows. But these examples, of course, are necessarily selective. Let me also stress another reason why we are so happy to have the two of you here, which is um, your deep commitment to Europe and your deep interest in fostering the exchange between researchers and policy makers. Richards, obviously was, was the founder and president of the Center for Economic Policy Research, CEPR. He also initiated the very successful blog, Vox EU, as well as the journal Economic Policy. Moreover, he uh, contributed, and he still contributes greatly, to the Advisory Scientific Committee of the European Systemic Risk Board, where I had the pleasure to work with him several years. Elaine is currently vice president of the CEPR and has put an enormous effort into the Women in Economics program, which I think is a fantastic initiative. Thank you so much for doing this with great enthusiasm. And of course, Elaine is also a very important voice in the European policy debates. But let us now dive into the topic of today's uh, conversation. I will try to keep my questions relatively short because it's not about me. It's about uh, you, about your answers, not my questions. And I would like to start with a question on recent market dynamics. So maybe I start with uh, Richard. So what uh, are, in your views, the main reason for the increased volatility that we have observed in financial markets? Thank you, Isabel. Um, some of you will be familiar with a quote from Harold Macmillan when he was Prime Minister of the United Kingdom for several years, a successful Prime Minister until things went bad. Uh, but they always do, don't they? Um, and uh, when asked what was his most important challenge in his role, he said, events, dear boy, events. <laughs> well, that's exactly what's happened. We've had COVID continuing, in particular in China. We've had Ukraine, commodity markets, major disturbances, elections, Germany, France, coming in the United States. None of these has been conducive to financial, financial stability. We've got a shift to the risk-off environment with both equity and bond markets sharply down. But I think also 
Uh, and I was a bit skeptical about this when it was first raised several years ago, the idea that uh, deep structural factors in the financial system have reduced liquidity and thereby created more volatility. I'm still, I'm still waiting to see the evidence of that, uh, but I think there's enough informal uh, evidence from the markets that this, is, that this has been important. Thanks, uh, Richard. So um, let me ask a bit, so what do you think, Elan? how does all of this affect the macroeconomy, maybe also monetary policy or the other way around? Thank you very much, Isabel. So, so far, uh, so good. I kind of agree with what Richard said. <laughs> <laughs> we did try to find areas of disagreement. You know. uh, so, uh, yes, risk on, risk off. Um, we... Uh, we see volatility having an effect on uh, financial friction, so tightening of financial constraints, whether you think about value at risk constraints, you think about uh, financing constraints. And we know that this, this is a powerful transmission channel to the macroeconomy. So this has an effect on uh, credit creation, this has an effect on capital flow, this has an effect on investment and uh, aggregate activity. So that's definitely a, a first amplification channel to the macroeconomy. But then, of course, there are direct effects. So we have this volatility uh, events, <laughs> uh, in particular through the commodity markets. And there we have direct effect on the production process, global value chain. We have direct effects uh, which uh, are uh, affecting very much the supply side of the economy. In a, an environment where the rebound from the COVID has come, an unbalanced rebound with some uh, bias towards, towards goods, so inflationary pressure, which you, know, you have to indeed deal with. And on the demand side, uh, we also see inflation uh, eating away the purchasing power of, uh, of households, in particular modest households, both because of the energy prices and, and food prices, which are constrained uh, uh, expenses. And, and, and I think also something we have to keep in mind as, uh, as macroeconomists is that very important general equilibrium effect uh, aggregate effect coming from uh, precisely the decrease in purchasing power of this category of households who also happen to usually work in cyclical sectors. And this has, in turn, aggregate effects on the economy. So powerful amplification mechanisms that we need to quantify for macro, for macro policies. Okay, well, so the, this is certainly very important. So the question then is, does all of this lead to acute risks for financial stability, Richard? I don't think we have yet such risks. We're not like 2008 when the banks were severely undercapitalized and when markets froze because no one could trust counterparties. The counter, no one could be sure that their counterparties wouldn't default overnight and so nobody wanted to deal with anybody. Um, it's not like 2020 either when we had the dash for cash uh, in March of 2020. At that point, VIX and high yield spreads both went above the 2008 levels. But, but, sorry, all you central bankers out there, um, I do see some risks for the central banks in particular that you may have to act as market makers of last resort. We still have not properly fixed the money market funds, in my view. Um, I know there are others that disagree with this, but and we've put a lot of effort into it, but I don't think it's been totally successful. Uh, and if stress were to come, I think that would be a, a first point of call. Um, we have pro-cyclical, still pro-cyclical center counter, uh, central counterparty margins on commodity derivatives, uh, and there are dangers for the central counter, counterparties themselves if things go bad. So, and there again, the central banks would have to step in. So I think, um, if I were in your shoes, all you central bankers out there, um, I would be concerned about this possibility that you may yet again be called upon to act as market makers of last resort. Yeah, one particular type of market dynamic that of course is on many people's mind here in the room is the threat of fragmentation in the euro area. So it seems that this is a very euro area specific thing. So why, why is that so? 
Well, so I think, so I'm going to say it's your area specific in a minute, but I'm going to start by saying actually not quite in a way, because uh, we are used to the fact that when interest rates go up and when we withdraw liquidity, which is something that is you know, happening uh, uh, right now, uh, there's more differentiation in asset markets. And so we see uh, spreads widening. We see market segmentation coming up. This is partly due to the uh, less liquidity for arbitrageurs, uh, various financial frictions uh, playing some capital flight behavior. So we see that in the international economy, when you look at the segmentation of emerging markets compared to, uh, to advanced economies, we see a phenomenon like that. We see also uh, in the uh, uh, corporate bond sector, think about uh, high yield uh, investment grade. And where uh, it is quite specific to the EU area is that there we see advanced economies, sovereign bonds, and indeed, why do we see these dynamics where we see increases in spread, we see more differentiation in the pricing. Well, it's kind of normal because there are different credit risks. And why are there different credit risks? Because we are not a fiscally integrated area, right? So that's, that's the, the basic uh, uh, structure, financial architecture of the euro we all know about. We are a currency union, but we are not uh, fiscally integrated. And therefore, we have heterogeneity in credit risk. And it's normal that this heterogeneity be priced, and it's going to be more priced when we withdraw liquidity from the system. So that's OK to have spreads. What is dangerous in terms of, that's where we go to the fragmentation theme, is when these spreads take on a, a life of themselves, when they become self-fulfilling when they become, uh, uh, there's a dynamics that settles in and uh, that is an unstable <coughs> dynamics. This, this we don't know and we, uh, we don't want and we have seen that, we have seen that in the past. So that's, that's the danger and that is what is specific to the, to the EU area because of lack of fiscal integration because we haven't finished the banking union, a big, a big theme <laughs> but uh, a lot of us have, have contributed to, but we haven't finished it. And we, uh, we have no, no capital market union, effectively. We have still no uh, area safe assets. So uh, because of all that, it's normal that we see some spreads, but we don't want instability in those spreads. This said, we are still in a situation in which yields are low, real yields are low, and therefore, you know, we should not panic. <laughs> we should just watch. Uh, what is happening, and, and make sure we have the tools to deal with whatever could come. And so, if, if I may, so how would you distinguish what is just like this effect of the general repricing and what is kind of more worrisome? So clearly, when you, uh, it's always the, <laughs> the same gray area that, you know, we have to deal with uh, uh, in macroeconomics when we talk about fundamental-driven uh, issues versus self-fulfilling uh, pricing. Uh, if we have dynamics which uh, seems to be unstable and not warranted, but we believe are fundamental variables, whatever that might be, and I'm, I'm aware that there we, we have to deal uh, with, with issues with uh, models and, and views about the world, uh, then, uh, of course, if instability uh, takes on speed or uh, we, we have to, to intervene. And, and the issue then is to, to do that in an environment in the, in the EU area where we have to both have at the same time risk sharing and at the same time still some, uh, some fiscal discipline. So that has been a little bit the dilemma of the EU area for a very long time, as, as you know. So that somehow reminded me of the 7 plus 7 report. <laughs> very much so, very much so. <laughs> This yes. Is, <laughs> uh, Richard, would you like to add anything on that specific point? No, I think uh, we want to talk about the general repricing in financial markets, perhaps. Uh, and um, I would just say, by the way, President, that lower for longer is still with us very much. Real rates are even lower than when we wrote a lower for longer report. So, and I think that is an important factor that mitigates some of the tensions that we are seeing out there uh, and should do in future. Um, but so what has changed? It's not just the tightening of monetary policy. Uh, it's the shift to risk off. Of course, the two are related. But I think you can conceptually uh, and in practice distinguish between them to some extent. Uh, and that uh, the process that we are seeing 
is, as Elen said, in some respects, it's gradual. Um, the rise in high yield spreads that we've seen, it's there, but it's been very slow, very gradual, nothing like what we see in the crisis periods. Um, similarly, Eurozone sovereign spreads, after all, come on, let's get serious here. Um, I know that um, everybody gets, is terribly worried about these things, but, um, uh, but Italian spreads this afternoon, when I looked, were 199 basis points over the Bund. They were 120 a year, a year ago. Uh, is this a dramatic deterioration? Well, not obvious. Portugal is up from 75 a year ago to 107 basis points today. Uh, again, not exactly um, dramatic, is it? Um, so I see the widening uh, is due at least as much to the general risk environment as to monetary policy, and in particular, not the fundamentals. Italian fundamentals, in some ways, in some respects, are better than they were a year ago. Uh, and, you know, it could, things could indeed be worse. According to a survey of asset managers conducted last month, uh, the um, asset managers showed perceived higher financial risk now than in 2008 or in 2020 after the, the events, okay? Wait a minute here. There's a psychology out there that is very strange. And yeah, maybe just one small comment on, because you, you mentioned the risk of moves. I mean, one thing that we haven't really seen that we've seen in, in previous episodes is these kind of safe haven flows. At the moment, mm -hmm. we are not, we are not in, seeing in, that. Indeed. And I think that's Absolutely an important, right. important point. Well, but let's, don't yes. get us wrong. We always have to be very careful and watchful for whatever oh, we may come certainly, in the We certainly <laughs> are, I can, I can assure you. But, but indeed, if you look at the debt to GDP ratio also of a uh, number of indebted economies, it goes down because of the nominal GDP growth. It's also That's, true. Yeah. So let me switch to a completely different topic, which is crypto assets. So, of course, we have seen some interesting dynamics in that uh, market as well. So the uh, market capitalization has uh, decreased quite dramatically uh, over the past month. So uh, one question that is, of course, on our mind is whether these uh, movements in crypto markets have any implications uh, for financial stability, so uh, whether we should be worried about um, uh, systemic risk, and maybe we should broaden the whole topic uh, a bit and talk not only about a crypto asset, but uh, really decentralized finance more generally. Well, as you know, Isabel, I've been thinking about these things too much over the past six months, um, and uh, some of you out there have been very helpful in that respect. Uh, but um, yeah, risk off has, among other things, caused a shift out of crypto. Perfectly normal, perfectly natural. Um, and uh, the Bitcoin prices, the um, uh, Ether prices uh, are way down. And even things that are written just a month ago, you said a month, actually, this has been going on for several months, but even something written by Bloomberg Intelligence last month, it's embarrassing what these guys write, you know, when they hype up how, you know, Ethereum is going to go to 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, now, soon, right? Well, Ether, I meant, excuse me. Um, but um, it ain't happening. And um, uh, so the question is, what are the risks? Uh, I think the risks are now small because of the relatively limited size of the crypto asset space. But given the rates of growth that we saw until this plunge, given those, if that, that trend comes back, that was very, very rapid growth. And we could indeed see fairly soon uh, something, a, 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 a space that is, is quite dangerous. So what are the risks? Well, the problem is that crypto assets, crypto markets do what the traditional financial assets and markets do, but they don't have the regulation, they don't have the backstops, they don't have the fiduciaries, and all, all these things that we have very painfully, over decades, over centuries, discovered are essential. But if you look closely, if they were properly regulated, they might just disappear. 
Think about that. <laughs> Think about that. So maybe let's, right. let's try that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, you said it, not me. I'm just, I just work here, you know. <laughs> now, some examples of instability you will be familiar with. The most important stable coin, so-called so stable coin, Tether, actually broke its peg to the dollar at one point very recently. Um, and its assets, people aren't saying much about it, but its assets are falling. Um, moreover, about a third of those assets are in commercial paper with an average residu residual maturity of 44 days. That is according to their Cayman Island accountants. Of course, but, oh. um, uh, there's Celsius, a major bank that lends, which had to gate withdrawals. Right? Um, there's Terra, everybody knows about the Terra Luna coming back down, not down to earth, below earth. Um, both are now worthless. Uh, so there are big dangers out there, potentially, if this space gets big. And on some, I neglected like to mention, on some crypto exchanges, believe it or not, Binance, it is possible to achieve leverage of between 100 and 125. And we thought Deutsche Bank in 2008 at 65 <laughs> was really a problem, yeah? Uh, wait a minute here. Um, uh, and finally, at least as dangerous in my view, at least as dangerous in my view, are the so-called smart contracts. Smart contracts are code, okay? They give automatic execution uh, without recourse. That is not smart, excuse me. We have contract law, we have commercial courts for good reason, because you can't write all contingencies properly into a contract. We learn that, you know, basic, not basic economics, but anyway, um, at some point we learn that. Um, and, um, and not having any structure like that, it seems to me, for these so-called smart contracts, the danger of just fat fingers even, not being able to call it back, that seems to me a problem. So yeah. I, I heard some skepticism <laughs> over there. <laughs> so, uh, Elaine, is there anything positive we could think about in the crypto asset world? I mean, something, I mean, could it lead to more financial innovation? Could there be financial inclusion? Do you have any, any positive so, uh, ideas uh, what positive effects crypto assets could have? So I would love to try, uh, you know, if you need to contradict Richard, right? <laughs> I mean, uh, I can. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to really try hard, but in, indeed, if I if I want, so first of all, to think about you know crypto. So uh, anything that it's called a cryptocurrency uh, so far, including the the most uh, uh, popular one, has nothing to do with with money. I think we all agree with that, right? The attributes of money are absolutely not represented by uh, in Bitcoin. Very bad medium of exchange, and that's actually by. Uh, that's really by design, in a way. The transaction costs are extremely high, very bad unit of account, very bad store of value. So this is not, this is not a currency. Now, if we think about uh, the other uh, styles of uh, cryptos, we can think about stable coins and all that. It is true that one could try to, to say, what is the business model? Okay? Is there any business model which doesn't have to do with avoiding regulation or avoiding uh, uh, fiscal... <laughs> Dues, or uh, indeed, not about getting seniorage. And if you if you try to to think about what are the business models which do not meet these three things, avoiding regulation or fiscal avoidance or, or seniorage, it's very hard to find. I'm afraid. So then you could say, okay, uh, maybe the technology. So in the technology, we have the, the programmability of. Uh, that could be, I mean, Richard seems to be very averse to that, right? But you could say, you know, maybe there's something good in program, program, programmability here. But if you think that, it's not the crypto object itself. The technology it can be used with CBDCs as well, presumably. Yeah. And so CBDCs, if there's something good to be there, could, wouldn't have all the other inconvenience. So then you can think about financial inclusion. You can think about possibly cross-border payment. But this could also be done with indeed CBDCs, uh, with some technological import there. So I'm afraid, I'm afraid, I'm going to come down on the same, <laughs> same side as, as Richard here. And when you mention uh, CBDC, 
So who would do the, the innovation? Would it be the central banks themselves or would it be so private the, 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 I mean, there you can, you can definitely have private innovation. What my point is that it's in the technology, it's not in the creation of a new currency, right? But, but you can distinguish between the two. And yeah, no, the, the, the public sector doesn't need to do everything. No, absolutely no, not. No, I perfectly <laughs> agree. <laughs> So um, we see that uh, digitalization is posing certain challenges. I see, I see another challenge, which is uh, cyber risk. So the, the frequency of cyber attacks has increased uh, quite dramatically. So um, should we be afraid that this could become systemic? So on cyber, it's another of these very difficult risks to, to assess because simply we don't have much data at all so far on these issues. So we have to be a bit, uh, look outside the box and try to find alternative uh, data sources to try to even measure uh, the threat. So we can, we can do that uh, because you know, the, the problem when we, we look at reported incidents is that there is a lot of underreporting. Obviously, people don't want to report when there are cyber attacks. So uh, we, can, we can find maybe some data elsewhere. There are some, for example, uh, we can analyze uh, uh, the call of analysts, uh, and we can, uh, with many, many companies, and see how often and uh, what they talk about when they discuss cyber risk, et cetera. So there's information in that, which seems to be able to predict, indeed, some actual cyber threat. So we can use this type of data. And when we do that, so what I think what we realize is that uh, cyber risk has increased quite a lot, in particular since uh, 2016. Uh, and also that cyber risk has been migrating a little bit, uh, it was more centered on the US to the rest of the world, to Europe, to Asia, has migrated to more sectors, in particular to the financial sector, uh, to the insurance sectors, it seems. And we, we start to see a little bit of it being priced, but of course the pricing must be very approximate, so not rely too much on that, but we, we start to see some, some pricing in, in, in stock prices, in, in option prices, and indication of contagion across companies. So to your point on, or your question on systemic risk, we start to see that there is a bit of contagion. That's obviously not uh, the only channel through which this risk could become systemic. It can be systemic if, it, if there's an attack of a systemic financial institution straight, straight on. I mean, that's, that's going to be there can be systemic if uh, there's correlated attacks or attacks on, uh, on companies which relies on the same uh, data provider or same uh, IT systems. And, and there, we, we simply don't have the data to, to, to really uh, assess these issues. So there are some uh, uh, different avenues, I think, by which this risk could easily become systemic. And we are just starting to see it happening. And we have to, to be very creative about the data, I think. Thank you very much. So we've talked now a lot about advanced economies. Let's maybe just very briefly also talk about uh, emerging markets. And we know that uh, times as today can be challenging for emerging markets when interest rates are going up. In advanced economies, uh, one uh, uh, could expect to see uh, capital outflows potentially uh, even uh, leading to financial crises. Um, so how, how do you see things currently? Maybe, Richard. Well, you asked this question on the day that Russia defaulted, the first time since 1917 on its international obligations. 1918, no? 17. Um, <laughs> see, we had to disagree on something. Right? I, think it's 18, I think it's 17. Um, but we can check that. Wikipedia out there. Go ahead. Somebody. Yeah, right. um, uh, I don't mind being wrong on this one. Right? Um, it's also the 250th anniversary, as pointed out by bloggers at the New York Fed, 250th anniversary this month of the outbreak of the first modern global financial crisis, the credit crisis of 1772-73. So I don't feel terribly comfortable addressing this question. Um, two major emerging market debt crises in the past came when US rates went up. Latin America, 1982. Mexico, 1994-95. Both of them required action by the United States and the IMF. And actually, the second one was some good for me, because um, with Barry Eichengreen, I ended up writing a piece called Crisis, What Crisis? that proposed collective action clauses, uh, which were ultimately adopted 
Um, but have they made the world safer? Some, I think, in fact, some. Um, but there are still dangers. We have rising rates and a rising dollar. And these raise the dangers of debt defaults, bank failures, and exchange rate crises in emerging market economies. And it's the interconnections among those three that really give rise to major financial crises. Now, are there systemic countries that are threatened? I think the first in line, and I don't hesitate to say this for a moment, uh, I'll name a name, Turkey, right? Uh, it does not look good. And uh, it would not be the first time, as we know. Uh, so um, I think whether Turkey has global systemic rele relevance, whether there would be any contagion, not at all clear. You had Argentina go down in 2000, um, and it hardly ruffled any feathers, except in Uruguay. Um, <laughs> but, um, uh, but still, Turkey might be a serious case. Uh, and so far, if you look at the data, the capital outflows from emerging market economies have been mild. So, you know, so far so good, but you know what that story is. Uh, <laughs> I'll stop. Yeah, uh, thanks, Richard. So um, you pointed to this kind of stylized fact that when rates go up, then these are the times that become risky. And that, of course, that's not just uh, true in emerging markets, but if we look, for example, at the US and when financial crises happened, they basically always happened when interest rates were going up. And so the, my final question to both of you would be, so when, when we go uh, to bed tonight after a wonderful dinner with many nice uh, conversations, uh, can we s still sleep well or should we, should we be worried? <laughs> Depends on how much we drink. <laughs> okay. well, so we know I what to do. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, it's no problem for me. I don't have to make monetary policy decisions. <laughs> right. Good luck to you all. <laughs> Thanks. So j let me just thank you for this fascinating conversation. It was a great pleasure being with you on stage. I will also enjoy sitting with you at the same dinner table. So um, thanks uh, for uh, coming in at relatively short notice. And it was really, it was fantastic. Thank you, Isabel. Thank, thank you, you very much. <laughs>